Okay, before we get going, I'd just like to introduce our participants up here for this evening. Starting on my far right is Mr. Chris Shipley, our Director of Finance and Operations, Ms. Lynn Town, Clerk of the Board, and Dr. Stan Olson, Superintendent. To my immediate left is Mr. Tom Hearn, Vice Chair, Ms. Lisa May, Board Member, Ms. Tambra Pickford, Board Member, and Mr. Dave Eubanks, Board Member. My name is Casey Morrisrow, I'm our Chair. Public comment on district-related items is scheduled near the start of this meeting. Please sign in on the sheet provided at the entrance door. Because of the diversity of issues, members of the board will not respond to public comment but made during tonight's meeting. Instead, issues may be recorded and referred to the proper staff person for follow-up. Comments may also be submitted to the board in writing through the clerk of the board. Okay, board members, is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the meetings of September 8th, September 11th, and September 20th, 2017? So moved. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on these? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, board recognition. I'm going to turn it over to Justin here. If you're ready, Justin. Could you just make sure the uh, button on the mic there is pressed? The little red light comes on. Thank that you. That would help. For those of you who don't already know me, my name is Justin Fine. I'm the safety and security coordinator for the district. Um, in collaboration with our nurses, they identified an issue um, needing AEDs in our schools. At the time, I happened to have been working with one of our local fire marshals who put me in contact with three local first responders who share that same goal. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Ryan Asher, Blaine Porter and Jared Pitts of HeartSafe. Thanks for uh, allowing us to come in this, uh, this evening and, and speak on behalf of HeartSafe. Um, this program was set forth, uh, started back in 2008, and we didn't finally uh, get the nonprofit going until uh, January this year. To give you a little bit of background, back in 2008, uh, I was a firefighter, or excuse me, engineer paramedic with Kootenai Fire, where I am currently a captain paramedic. I ran a cardiac arrest on a young individual at the middle school, um, and unfortunately, he expired. The <clears throat> mother, or excuse me, the mother of his best friend um, also worked for us at that time, and, and his best friend wanted to know if an AED would have saved his life. At that point, it wasn't. Come to find out, the, um, the school, Post Hall School District, uh, didn't have a whole lot of AEDs within their school system. And she asked me how we can achieve this. I came up with some different ideas, uh, working through medical vendors and a side, another side business that I have. And uh, I came up with an AED in a, in a short amount of time for that school. As I inquired more with the uh, school district, they needed a, a good seven or eight of them more. And then over the last nine years, we've put, I've put uh, AEDs within that school system. But I didn't want it to stop there. I inquired, I talked with Justin, uh, the, uh, Blaine Porter with Coeur d'Alene Fire and Jared and their staff, seeing how many AEDs do the school does, does our community need for within our county and it was quite a large number um, so I decided let's let's get this ball rolling let's make it happen and and so like I said in January uh, we started the nonprofit called HeartSafe and over the course of time we've collected uh, just about twenty five thousand dollars from uh, local businesses and, and uh, folks uh, Parker Subaru and Jim Parker and family um, Chief Steve Isaacson, Ember, Centennial Distributing, Dan and Mark Duvall, um, to name a few. And so tonight we come to you and we have nine brand new Zoll AEDs, um, estimated cost of roughly $1,500 per unit for your school district. Uh, in talking with, hey, clap, 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 okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
In, in talking with Justin and, and the staff, um, I've identified uh, roughly 12 more that your school district is in need of. That puts three in the high schools, one in the office, one in the gym, a traveling one, two in the middle schools, and then each of the middle schools, and then one per elementary school. Um, but as more donations come in, and it's not just businesses, it's folks like your, yourselves that can certainly donate. Um, it's not just for the kids either. It's for the staff. It's for the parents, the grandparents that come in. Uh, just last week, the coach at Timberlake uh, High School went to full cardiac arrest. Staff did CPR on him. They had one AED there. They ran and got it. They came back. And he is alive today because of these devices. And that's why we want to make sure that um, these devices are accessible within our community. So thank you. That's it. Thank you. Ryan, I think on behalf of the board and the district, again, we'd just like to thank you. We, we really appreciate this and, and know that, as you said, it, it can make a huge difference like it did at Timberlake uh, just, just a week or so ago. If folks are interested in donating, how can they get a hold of you? I went ahead and passed some flyers around. Each one of you should have one in your packet. Um, otherwise, um, I can be reached. Uh, at, I can give everybody my phone number or uh, my address or you can contact Justin would actually be the, the, the best point of contact and he knows how to get a hold of me. Okay, perfect. Right? So through Justin Fine with the Coeur That'll District. work too. All right. All right, thank you. Yeah, you bet, thank you. Thank you, can I ask one question? The, the traveling one, does that go to like athletic events or how would you? Absolutely. And so, um, believe it or not, it, um, a lot of schools don't have AEDs within their facilities. Um, and like I said, it's our aim to have, have them in all of our schools. So. The football team or the volleyball team they take it with them but as we get more donations we're going to be able to put more units within those schools for traveling and and to take it take it up a notch um, it's through legislation there is no law requiring in the state of idaho uh, that aeds be present in the school nor cpr requirements for the staff and so that's something that in in due time uh, that we hope to change as well so with, with each of those, you have somebody trained to use them, obviously. That would be a concern. That, that is correct. Each of the, each of the school districts, um, I'm going to speak on behalf of the Post Hall School District. I do the, the instruction for the staff that wants to take it. Again, it's not a requirement. Um, Blaine, there's Blaine. Um, he's also an instructor. Jared's an instructor. And so we've kind of divided it up. I'll take care of Post Falls, you take care of Coeur d'Alene, and, and, and then the Lakeland School District based on where our fire departments run through. Um, and so we're more than happy to get together with staff if we get a list uh, of folks that, that want to take this course. And uh, we'll set up a time, a date, and we'll make it happen for you. All you got to do is ask. <laughs> well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Trustee Eubanks, do you have our uh, Invest, Inspire, Innovate Awards and Shining Star Award recipients? I do, but I want to say something to at the outset. I've had a massive heart attack in my past in 2002. Yes, I think it's on. Yeah, I had a big heart attack a long time ago. And uh, we're going to work on those donations, okay? You just never know when something like that might slip into your day. I just never know. Hey, hey uh, uh, awards here. Uh, one of the most valuable assets any child can have is a good teacher. 
And when that teacher is beyond good, when that teacher is truly amazing, magical things happen with kids in a classroom. Speaking of such teachers, each school month, our district, in partnership with the Coeur d'Alene Education Partnership and the Panhandle Kiwanis, recognizes and honors three outstanding teachers in the Coeur d'Alene School District who do magical things with kids in the classroom. For the month of September 2017, our first Invest, Inspire, and Innovate honorees of the year are, uh, first uh, we have Carrie Tapia, uh, Coeur d'Alene High School math teacher, and we uh, surprised her a few days ago with balloons and uh, some other things, and uh, from everything we could tell, she was most deserving. And next we have, um, we went to Woodland and surprised Doug Shryock, a special education teacher, and he was completely shocked and blown away. And um, one of the best parts of our job, I guess I can say, is um, getting to award these awesome teachers that we have and um, just let them know how grateful we are for all they do in our district. So thank you for letting me team up with you. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime anybody else can come along too. And hey, we have Stephen Blee of Ramsey Magnet uh, Elementary School, a fifth grade teacher. And uh, oh my, I, I had an afro a long time ago too. But uh, in any case, he's our elementary teacher. Uh, invest, inspire, and innovate. I may need to talk to Stephen about what's maybe in store for him. And then do we have a, a Shining Star Award? We do not. We have not done that yet. Okay, so that takes care of that. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Eubanks and Trustee Pickford. So we'll go on to our student body reports as Venture High School is here tonight. I see you guys. Welcome. Come on up. Let us know what's going on at Venture. Again, if you'll just make sure the little red light on the mic is on there, please. All right, good evening, to, good evening to you all. My name is Alicia Rovic, and I am here to represent the career technical education classes at Venture High School. Venture school year is off to an amazing start. Students are settled in and learning in and out of the classroom. Um, the leadership class is busy working on the dirt space in front of the school, hoping to transform it into a common space for learning and socializing. Last year's food service production and management students led the way on working hard and earning enough money to purchase four picnic tables from KTEC. Our leadership students have been working on leveling the ground in the preparation for the winter and possible planting of a tree and some bushes. We hope more improvements will be following. Our 21st century skills classes are moving forward with valuable lessons on learning soft skills for the workplace and creating a supportive climate at Venture for All. On Monday, September 25th, our staff spent all day in training to help facilitate better teaching on these skills. Also. Members of the leadership class will be sponsoring a gourmet popcorn fundraiser event to help raise funds to improve the courtyard of the school. The sale will be open October 1st to the 22nd. Be sure to contact the school if you would like to support this effort. The food and nutrition culinary classes have been working hard to earn their safety and sanitation certifications. To date, quite a few students have received their certifications and are ready for employment in the Coeur d'Alene School area restaurants. I am one of them. October 28th will be one of our, will be our annual Boo Boo Q. And <laughs> it is our fall barbecue. This is a school tradition that will, that all our students love and look forward to being a part of each year. Coming November will be our annual, annual pumpkin roll sale. Proceeds from the sale will help support our school and community food banks as well as school activities. Any questions? All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is someone from KTEC here tonight? Welcome. Come on up. Hello, uh, my name is Emily Paulus and I'm representing KTEC. I go to both Lake City High School and KTEC. I am in the engineering program and this year at KTEC, I am here to inform you that we are fully enrolled and we have a new 
auto and collision uh, program. Uh, I go to KTEC to in the engineering program to learn more about the engineering field, and I think this is a great opportunity that our community has provided because it is the hands-on experience of the workplace, and it is treated as a work environment. Is there any questions? Any questions? Go ahead. Uh, what year are you? What, what year? I'm a senior in high school, so it's my second year at KTEC. And you plan on pursuing an engineering program uh, after graduation? Yes, I am. I plan on going to college and having internships at a company here that's actually in Coeur d'Alene, HDR. Congratulations and best wishes. Thank you. Okay, Coeur d'Alene High School. Welcome. Hello, I'm Rachel Dooley, the Coeur d'Alene High School ASB president. These are two of our ASB officers, Abby and Emily. Currently at CHS, it's homecoming week, so student council is really busy with that. Um, we have our dance Saturday, and then we have, we have spirit days throughout this week, um, and then the football game is Friday night, so that's what we're working on this week. Student council made our float. Um, there's a lot of other clubs that are making floats this year, like leadership and other sports are too for the parade, um, and then our parade is on Sherman on Thursday. Um, and then after homecoming week, we are going to have um, a fundraiser, and it's for Hurricane Harvey victims. Um, Emily, she actually has family in Houston, and we're partnering with a school that her cousin goes to, and we're gonna be partnering with them and raising money specifically for their school. Um, just, it's really cool so we can see exactly where that's going and who we're helping out. Um, so that's going to be later this month and we're doing a coin drive. And then just last week we had a food drive for our food pantry. Um, I don't know if all of you know, but we have a community food pantry in our school. And we have our first shipment coming in next week, I believe. Um, but just to get people to know where it's located and to raise awareness for it, we had a food drive and to raise food for it, of course. And that went really well. Leadership helped with that and we raised money and food for that. Um, yeah, so that's what's going on at our school right now. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. Uh, Lake City High School. Good evening, esteemed board chair, honorable trustees, superintendent Olson, and district administration. My name is Val Lago Sosa, and I'm the ASB president at Lake City High School. My three fellow ASB officers had a soccer game that got rescheduled for tonight, so they were unable to make it here this evening. We just concluded our homecoming week last week, and it was an amazing success. Our student body had such a good time with our spirit days, and our parade was the largest it's ever been, featuring 28 entries, including our royalty, football, and grand marshal counseling team, and also many other student groups and organizations. Halftime at the football game, which we won, was highlighted by our incredible marching band and the crowning of our homecoming king and queen. And then our homecoming dance was that Saturday night, which featured a record-breaking number of students from all three high schools and a beautiful decoration that everyone enjoyed. We also had our senior start last Friday, which featured a new format of breakout sessions with information about college applications and the senior paper. And then outdoor team building activities were done that afternoon. It was a big success for our seniors and we got lots of good information. October is a busy month for us as well with our Coats for Kids drive starting up this week. In addition, our student council will be presenting a breakout session at the regional student council conference in a couple of weeks. Our college preparations also continue this month as we'll be hosting the All Things Senior Night tomorrow night and we'll be offering the PSAT on October 11th. Our college prep classes also go to campuses of U of I and WSU and our students attend the Spokane National College Fair at the Spokane Convention Center. Our fall play, The Susification of Romeo and Juliet, also opened last week and continues through this weekend. It is a very fun and well done play so we encourage everyone to come. We are also proud to announce that Lake City has two National Merit semifinalists and one commended student of the National Merit Prog Program through College Board. Our two semifinalists were Chris Vargas and Ashley Cates, and our commended student is Natalie Magnus. 
In addition, the College Board has recognized two of our students in the National Hispanic Recognition, Recognition Program, Natalie Magnus and Christopher Vargas. So we are very proud of those classmates. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you guys today. Okay, thank you all for uh, being here tonight and sharing that with us. Impressive stuff going on at all those buildings. Mr. Twitchell, welcome. Do you have a uh, Coeur d'Alene Education Association report for us? All right, board members, uh, Superintendent Olson and district office staff, thank you for allowing me to be here once again. Um, it's crazy to think that we're a month into the school year already. Um, you know, people are all settled in. The honeymoon period's kind of over in the classrooms. Uh, people know each other. Students are sharing their germs with all of us. Um, in fact, just yesterday I was at Walgreens and I took up a double pack of NyQuil, an industrial sized bag of cough drops, and a big uh, tube of Icy Hot. And the lady there said, Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> so um, I'm going to apologize right now when I'm done with this. I think I'm going to go home and try some of that NyQuil so I can get to sleep. So if something exciting happens, someone will have to fill me in. Um, in some CEA news, um, Kelly Aiken, uh, who left our district, unfortunately, not too long ago, um, she was the vice president. We have now filled that position. It is Jeff Lake, who is also at Coraline High School, where I'm at. Um, and so he's very excited to be there and raring to go and help out as much as he can. Uh, Dr. Olson, we would like to thank you for coming to our building rep meeting. That, that meant a lot that you value our input and um, wanted to take some time to introduce yourself to the members and, uh, like I say, just hear what we had to say. So thank you very much for that, and we hope that that communication can continue. And also I'll just put out the invitation right now to heck virtually anyone here. If you want to come to one of those meetings, let me know and we'd love to have you there. So you can hear from you and you can hear from us. Um, what else do we have here? Um, on the topic of school safety, um, I, I would like to thank the board for not, what's the best way to put this? I guess put out flat, put in, not having a knee-jerk reaction um, in light of recent events. Um, after the Sandy Hook shooting in 2012, the district passed a $1.4 million levy in order to make our schools safer. Um, I, I talking to many of our members, teachers, even students, would honestly say that our schools definitely are much more secure, but whether or not that leads to safety or not, I don't know. Um, and uh, along those lines, too, I don't know how you could really measure that either. Um, but with the recent events happening at schools and countries, we would love to partner with the district administration to develop meaningful methods of training for staff. Some of these items could include methods of identifying and reporting potential threats to our schools, developing a system for families to communicate potential threats during and out of school hours, and then also at all building levels, and I think this is being done, but just to make sure, but uh, to teach students and staff to identify the, meeting, the meaning of each of the different alarms that happen. Um, just ways of getting more communication happening with that and identifying the threats before something happens. Um, and that's about all I have for tonight, so any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Twitchell. I hope you are feeling better soon. Okay, so we're up to public comment here. Um, before we move into that, I just want to remind the public that while this is a meeting of the Board of Trustees that takes place in public, it is not a meeting with the public. It is a meeting of the Board to conduct district business. The Board does allow some limited public comment on district-related items. Those wishing to address the Board during this public comment period are limited to one comment not to exceed three minutes. If you have additional comments, that you would like to present to the board, you may provide those comments in writing through the clerk of the board, Ms. Lynn Town. Ms. Town will ensure that the board members receive the additional commentary. Please keep in mind that board members will not respond to public comment. If I determine that an individual statement is too lengthy, personally directed, abusive, or repetitive, I may terminate your right to address the board. With all that fun stuff said, we will uh, start here. First up is Deborah Webb. Mm -hmm. 
Deborah. Okay. All right. Well, I will move on. If Deborah pops back in here, we'll come back to her. Uh, Ryan Davis. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan Davis, Executive Director of Boys and Girls Club of Kootenai County. With me tonight, although she chose that she did not want to speak, is Jamie Paul, who is our branch director, who happened to attend Lakes and now is running her own Boys and Girls Club right next to Lakes, and a recent homeowner that said she could only do it because she had an amazing shop teacher at Lakes, but we'll leave that one alone. <laughs> um, Chairman, trustees, staff, I wanted to come before you uh, for three specific reasons tonight. The first one is to say thank you. 13 months ago, we opened up the uh, Lola and Dwayne Hagedorn Center right next to Lakes Middle School, and I'm happy to report that we are nearly 1,750 members strong at that facility. We ran some wonderful after-school programs, which rolled into a very successful summer program and uh, have started back up into the school year. Uh, continually making an impact on young people's lives. Quick recap is that Boys and Girls Club is not a daycare. It's not a babysitting service. We are a youth development agency <laughs> focusing on keeping kids active and in a safe, controlled environment with paid professional staff. Um, today, we had a group of teens in the kitchen making fettuccine Alfredo. So you can imagine the 20,000 square foot facility smelled very good. And as uh, one becomes hungry in the evening, it's a little hard to, to, to smell that. But every day the kids get a snack, every day the kids are engaged in different activity. We've been able to make some wonderful partnerships with the district. Uh, we are now up and rolling with our iReady program. We have a power hour program that focuses on after school homework assistance, making sure that kids get their homework done. We have a room that is specifically for STEM programs. Let me, let me step back. It was STEM. Now it uh, is STEAM, and now it's becoming STREAM because I believe we're adding reading as well. Needless to say, opportunities um, to work outside of the box. In addition to physical education programs, how, learning how to win, and in many cases teaching these kids that it's okay if things don't go right and there is some failure, here's how you get yourself back up and dust yourself off and continue on. So we've had great amount of success, could not have done it without the partnership of the district. So one, I wanted to say thank you. Two, I wanted to bring before you, we have a partnership with busing that has been very successful, but there's two specific requests that I have tonight just to throw out um, that would hopefully spark discussion in the future. Number one, we have uh, Bora, Bryant, and Sorensen Elementary um, that kids are being picked up and brought on the bus. In many cases, these kids are being brought up. For instance, in Sorensen, the kids are picked up and they spend approximately 45 minutes on the bus and Boys and Girls Club is one of the last areas that they're dropped off. Would love to sit down and have discussion and look at the opportunity of possibly trying to expedite something to get these kids off of the bus sooner and into safe hands and a snack and after school activities. Um, those three schools have been um, uh, experiencing elongated times on the bus and that would be something that I would love to, uh, to discuss. The second piece is to look at the opportunity to strengthen the busing relationship that we currently have. We, uh, as the ranch director, my director of operations has basically said, if you give us the opportunity, we can fill it. For instance, right now at Atlas, we have 10 spots that are available to bus kids from Atlas. We have over 20 kids that are signed up waiting, so there's not enough spots for them. At Bryan, we have, uh, zero spots available because of busing and we have gotten creative with a van to get 33 kids 25 to 30 kids a day over from brian for nan we have 40 allotted spots which is fantastic we appreciate that but we're upwards of almost 70 kids that are trying to get into the program and at ramsey we have 25 uh, slots on the bus and we have 33 kids that are waiting i say that and we have not went into these schools and recruited and reminding the trustees that it is $20 to be a member to the bo uh, for the Boys and Girls Club for the entire school year. Um, we deal with a variety of kids. Well over half of our kids are highly at risk, at or below the poverty level by determined by the district. We also deal with a huge percentage of working middle class that don't have options because they simply can't afford it. But we put together a 
first-class project, first-class programs with first-class staff. As the district does such a wonderful job, I would like to look or would like to ask you guys to consider looking at maybe the possibility of strengthening our busing program so that we can strengthen our young people. That being said, um, if anyone has questions, other than that, thank you again for your time and the partnership that we've been able to create. Ryan, thank you for, for coming down here and taking a little time out of your evening to talk to us. I just want to make sure I heard you correctly on the three schools you mentioned at first with the long travel, Bora, Brian, Sorensen, was that correct? Okay. Thank you. Okay. I would like to add that I don't believe even one of those schools is more than five minutes away. Okay. Dr. Olson, you have your superintendent's uh, report, comments for us tonight? I do, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple of quick items. One is uh, uh, a recap of the um, data summit uh, from September 20th. We are still in the process of distilling uh, input uh, from uh, that meeting, uh, organizing it, uh, and uh, putting it into uh, a structure that we can address uh, at our next meeting. Um, we are taking a look at, and we'd ask you to pencil this in on your calendars, we're taking a look at November 15th for our next meeting that would be held at this site. Uh, our hope is to be able to steal another day uh, from uh, the morning until the uh, mid-afternoon uh, from those who participated before and others who could not make uh, the first meeting. Our focus on this meeting, again, would be the data sets that we were not able to cover in the first meeting. That's SAT, ACT, uh, advanced placement, concurrent credit, uh, and a few other uh, secondary-based uh, assessments and performance reviews. And then also uh, begin the process of um, reviewing that which has been said and structuring that on <clears throat> agendas for future discussions and coverages. Uh, that's item one. Item two uh, is that uh, we are continuing to do uh, SWAT exercises. You may recall we started with the Board of Trustees, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats um, uh, discussion. Uh, we did that with a, on an individual basis with Board Trustees. Uh, we did uh, the members of the Coeur d'Alene Education Partnership. Um, the um, RISE organization, uh, we are scheduling uh, building-based administrators, central office-based administrators. Uh, we are also scheduling ASB students. Um, we're going to do on the 24th of this month an exercise in this room where all ASB representatives from our three high schools will gather uh, to go through that exercise. It's our belief that incorporated in the report uh, from uh, those of us that are employees or community stakeholders uh, should be our most important stakeholders, the youngsters that have gone through the process uh, and uh, can speak to um, our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and um, other things that uh, prompt uh, their uh, view of the district. Um, I want to emphasize uh, a couple other quick things. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, the Lake City High School performance, the susification of Romeo and Juliet. Had a chance to see that Friday night. Um, it's terrific. Uh, remarkable, remarkable performance. Many professional, quality professional level performances. If people uh, in our community have any doubts as to the skill level of their students and the ability of our program to help kids um, help kids uh, reach exceed their grasp you ought to see that performance it, it is exceptional and I encourage you I believe it has three performances this week um, get a chance go see that uh, it'll it'll uh, if you're not already a believer which I know all board members and uh, most of the people in this room uh, very definitely are believers uh, this one really will 
And lastly, uh, had a good chance to meet uh, a youngster today by the name of Jim Kennard. Uh, stopped by the administration building. Jim is a special needs student at Lake City High School. Um, brought his mom along for a discussion to thank the school district, the Board of Trustees, and the school district for um, giving this young man a number of opportunities to shine in the classroom, on the athletic field, uh, and in the social setting in the school and community. Um, he is a special needs youngster that has a number of challenges uh, that he will overcome as a result of his experiences at Lake City and in the larger community. Um, you are to be congratulated on exceptional work and uh, that's coming actually from the Kennard family. Um, I, I'd, I'd, offer, I'd offer my congratulations as well, but you already know that. Um, just a fi very fine work from the special services area, uh, from the high school program, from the athletic program, and the broad circle of peers uh, that support this young man. Um, exceptional work. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Rosen. Uh, board trustee comments, we have a number of things on here, so I'm going to start at my left, I guess, and uh, Trustee Hearn, I assume you're re the Region I, 1 I, meeting. And I'll just be very brief on this, because uh, all of the trustees attended the Region 1 ISBA meeting last Thursday evening. Legislators were invited to attend that, uh, but only one showed up, <coughs> Senator Bob Nonini. Uh, they had other commitments, I understand. Uh, I did talk to the um, executive director of ISBA, and we're going to try to come up with something impossible be, um, before they go south to Boise again so we can get them to listen to the concerns that these uh, trustees have. Anyway, we had um, basically trustees from every school district, uh, with the exception of Sandpoint and the ones in the Silver Valley. We had Lakeland Post Falls, Bonners Ferry. River, et cetera, and um, discussed a lot of things, but uh, pro primarily we discussed the uh, ISBA proposed resolutions, which is another agenda item, which I'll get into uh, in, a, in a little while. Um, remind, I want to remind people also that there's an annual conference of ISBA in Coeur d'Alene this November, and the date is, what do you have it here? 8th, 9th, and 10th. So it's in Coeur d'Alene. So that's a, quite an event, and I think that uh, you don't have to just be a trustee to go necessarily. You can, if staff or others can go. It's just really uh, quite a, uh, uh, it's gotten quite large. In fact, there are ISBAs considering how, how much longer they can have this in Coeur d'Alene. It's gotten too large for, for the Coeur d'Alene Resort. And uh, that is something they may not do in a couple of years. They've already, they've been talking about that. But anyway, so it was a great meeting. Um, I. Uh, appreciate everybody, all the trustees showing up for that, and I think we got some good work done. And uh, one more thing, trustees, uh, my term as chair for Region One will expire uh, in a, at the at the end of the conference in November. So we're going to be looking for a vice chair to step up. Well, actually, we have the vice chair will move up to the chair position, but we're going to need be looking for nominees for the vice chair. We have one person kind of expressing interest, but. If any of you are interested in getting involved in ISBA, that's a good opportunity too. So anyway, thank you. I will talk about the resolutions more later. Thank you. You'll actually be looking for three. We have the new alternates. Uh, oh, we have we're, yeah, we're large and small district, district alternates too. We, we'd qualify as a large district alternate. Yeah. Trustee Eubanks, are the rest of these yours? I believe they are. Right here. <laughs> I'll make it fast. I have four basic items I, I'd like to share with you quickly. Uh, the first has to do with Jingle Books 2017. This is our community book drive to get multiple children's books into the hands and homes of every one of our K3 kids for Christmas. And this will start October 16th and run through December 8th. In the last three years, Jingle Books has received and distributed some 85,000 new and used children's books to help improve early childhood literacy in Kootenai County. Donation boxes will, be, will once again be set up in all our public schools, many churches, and local businesses, and I hope you will support this worthwhile effort. The second item on my list has to do with local history. Uh, for the fourth consecutive year, Robert Singletary, 
our most uh, renowned local historian and I will soon be making the rounds uh, to our secondary schools and we're presenting this year the Farragut Naval Training Station and Coeur d'Alene in World War II. In case you were unaware, Farragut, 25 miles north of Coeur d'Alene, was where the U.S. Navy trains nearly 300,000 recruits during World War II, uh, with nearly all of, all of them uh, destined uh, for combat in the Pacific Theater. With over 700 buildings, almost all of which are now gone, and with so many critical and important wartime activities there at Farragut, um, this had a huge impact on Coeur d'Alene and its surrounding area. Robert and I will share old photos, great stories, and a fair amount of excitement with everyone. Secondary teachers can still sign up through our esteemed Dr. Trina Cottle. Okay. <laughs> the third thing I'd like to talk about, I had a chance uh, last week to attend the elementary cross-country meet on Thursday at the fairgrounds, and I got to tell you, it was as exciting as it was successful. With over 800 kids participating, it was apparently the largest such event in 27 years, and I'd like to thank all who made it worthwhile and fun. And along the same lines, on Saturday, October 21st at McEwen Park, there is another opportunity for kids to have fun running. It's called the Monster Mash Dash, a charity fundraiser for special needs recreation. And it'll be held that morning, and it'll be accompanied by lots of music and trick-or-treating provided by local businesses. And you can contact Jason Wheelock at Lakes for more information. And the very last thing I would like to share with you has to do with our data summit that uh, Dr. Olson was talking about a few minutes ago. As we once again set about to scrutinize our district's data on probably November 15th, taking note of what's working well and what needs improvement, I would like to ask the administration for some additional data if it exists. I want to know about our students' level of historical and civic literacy. For example, do all our graduating seniors in the Coeur d'Alene School District have a basic understanding of American history, all of them? And what evidence is there to support such? Do all our kids, by the time they leave our district, understand what a democracy is? Do they know how our government works and that our Constitution is more than just about freedom of speech and gun rights? Do all our students actually study civics at some point in time? And is their knowledge of such ever assessed on a standardized test? I'm asking these uh, questions because knowledge of these two subjects helps form the foundation of good citizenship. And because those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, and because recent national surveys indicate um, such literacy across our country is in woeful decline. I look forward to seeing whatever data you have. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Eubanks and Trustee Hearn. Okay, our consent agenda tonight is fairly brief. Is there a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda, items A through F? So moved. Okay, thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, Miss Town. Okay, we are into our information items. First up, Chris Shipley with our finance report. It's on the screen too? Okay. I feel more comfortable at the podium, but I can do this from here. <laughs> Okay, finance report. So, um, and on the finance report, too, also is answering the question of, of why. So the school district, the operations, finance, I could talk for 20 minutes, an hour to two hours. So clearly this is a condensed uh, version of the finance report. And the reason why is that I feel that it's important for governance to know that management, myself, is responsible with my duty in carrying out the leadership 
uh, the Coeur d'Alene School District's finance and operations. So it's important for you to know that what we are doing at the district office is carrying out our responsibilities, that somebody really is watching these numbers and doing our job to our utmost. With that being said, let's get after it. Starting from the top, this is the monthly budget status report for the month of August 2017. As you know, July, August, fairly slow. Things get fast starting in September. Now, when I read through here, a couple things I just want to point out to, to the trustees. Property tax emergency levy, budget zero, correct. We did collect a little bit. That's because there were collections made from the prior emergency levy. Um, if you were to slide down to the bottom, total revenue and transfers, you'll see that the amount that we have collected compared to budgeted is already at 43.58%. We're only a few months in. Why? That's because we get front-loaded uh, monies from, from the state. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and that percentage compared to the prior year, if you'll see the note down below, is that we're, we're tracking percentage-wise to budget very similar to what we did last year. Expenditures, again, if you were to slide down and take a look at expenditures, one thing to note is that if you look at total budgeted expenditures before transfers, that's $70 million. If you slide over to the right, you'll see in the grayed out section, budgeted salary and benefits of 60 million. Well, no surprise that the large majority of the budget is spent for salary and benefits. Actually comes out to be 85%. Okay, step back from this piece of paper. And if you were to look at the district all funds, including debt service, we still run at about 80% district-wide for payroll and, and benefits. So that's one area that we, as management um, and everybody involved, closely monitor because it's where all the money is spent. Okay, back to the page. Again, if you look at that percentage at the line total expenditures and transfers, 5.71%, very comparable to the prior year of 6.23%. So how we are collecting money and how we are spending it, no surprise, we're very similar to the prior year. If you were to look then at the cash balances, beginning cash balance and then our ending cash balance, uh, it appears that we are wildly overfunded with 31 million but again that's just pointing out that because we have received monies before we have expended it it, it was front loaded all right turn the page mr shipley just real quick on that yes. page before you turn it because i didn't notice this before but that's okay i see you have uh our beginning equity balance is that our fund balance That is our fund balance. That's what we are um, looking at with our audit. We're wrapping up. We only have a draft at this point, but that is our fund balance, ending fund balance. And in our budget for last year, were we 4.5? Is that where we we're about, we're going to come in? Or? Yeah, we're about $16,000 higher than we were um, prior fund balance. So okay. right on, basically. Nice job by the finance team. Thank you. All right. Turn the page if you already have not. This is, again, just through August, so it's not going to have a large amount of payroll involved in it. But what this really does, it just gives out, it zooms out, if you will, from, from page one, and then a little more detail. And honestly, there's not going to be a whole lot of excitement here. Good news to hear from your finance guy, by the way. Um, <laughs> And the following page, if you were to turn it over, this is the same information presented to you in graphical form. 
again, this is just through August. Um, I should stop there and just tell you that I do have numbers in that because I know what we paid in September also, but it wasn't in your packet. So we are three months in through September, just on payroll, just in all funds combined. We're $200,000 more in payroll than we were in the prior year. But that was, that was planned, so there was raises given. So um, if that number were to have been 600, 800,000, uh, I would raise my hand and I, you would have heard from me. <laughs> So I say that to tell you again to know that um, at the district office, this is something that we watch closely. Again, salaries and payroll um, and benefits. <laughs> All right, back to the page. And then, of course, enrollment is important for the school district. Um, we get paid. Enrollment drives average daily attendance is one way that we get paid from the state, as you know. And if you'll see there the total 10,810, that has increased from the previous year by 68. But if I can just say, you know, like, that's great. It is in increasing. We do assume that we will increase in enrollment uh, we actually budgeted a flat enrollment in ADA as far as budgeting, uh, not to be confused with planning. If you do look at that column June 2017, that is 10,582. So you can see, again, compared to the seven, I'm sorry, 10,742, September 2016, there was uh, student enrollment erosion, is what I called it, of 160. So uh, there is some erosion with enrollment, but again, you, I would imagine, are even much more of an expert than I am on this. So I'll stop while I'm ahead and take questions if there are any, you know, or we can move on. I have one, which is okay. uh, just in regard to enrollment. Um, you know, last year in our ADA, kind of had um, abnormal, high, uh, low ADA. I guess you'd say we we had more absent than normal, a little bit. How, how have we looked through the first thirty days, or do you know that yet? Uh, uh, we do we do track that. We have attendance mm -hmm. tracking, and obviously we we also have. I can't believe I'm forgetting this top of my head, but people who don't show up to school, are they absent? Oh, an absence report. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have that, and it's been, it's been positive. There, it, we haven't seen a variation that has deviated what I would call from the mean. This is back of the envelope mean calculation, by the way. So we're normal, and I believe that last year part of the ADA downward was a lot of it had to do with weather-related. Yeah. I had a question. How often does the state measure our average daily attendance? Is it monthly or is it quarterly? I believe what's important to us, I believe there is three measurement dates. I'm shooting from the hip here, but I believe there's three measurement dates here and they take the best of the 28 weeks. Yeah. And then there's a non-simple calculation that they use to get your beneficial units times an amount that the state has appropriated for all the school districts. The most important um, period of attendance is our first reporting period, basically until I think the first week of November, from the start of school to the first week of November. That um, is how we are calculated our salary-based apportionment, which is about 75% of our funding. So if we're gonna do really well in attendance, it needs to happen in that first reporting period. Beyond that, our um, entitlement funding or support unit funding, um, which is discretionary, is based on the best 28 weeks of average daily attendance. So we're reporting attendance data to the state daily, um, and then that goes into the formulas that calculate um, those different um, periods that 
you know, give us the different types of funding. Do they reevaluate then, like after Christmas, let's say in the second semester for a reporting period, or is it just the beginning of the year is your main number that they use for staff portion? It's set. Um, so that first reporting period, there's nothing that we can do to get it. You know, if we have a couple of, um, I think the windstorms might have been last year or the year before, that was in that first reporting period. Um, there's nothing we can do to appeal it. Um, so yeah, we just have to be kind of um, strategic and if we say it's a no school day or use it in emergency closure, that sort of thing, so. I have a question. Are we doing anything to specifically promote better attendance, having an attendance drive like we have done in years past? Not that I, I'm aware of. I take it that's a no. <laughs> that might be, uh, Scott, are you in the booth? That might be a question for Scott Maven if he's in the booth. Um, or Trina can answer. Yeah. I mean, apart from the ADA, uh, regular school attendance is really important to success in school. And that's really the bigger issue. And in some years in the past, we have put out a lot of effort in the first month or two of the school year to get kids to school. I'm just wondering if we're doing anything like that now. And I, and I would say, and Kate's not here to answer for elementary, but we have been communicating with um, Scott and with our principals. Um, that is one of our goals, to increase attendance. Um, last week, um, we had the ASCA training with our secondary counselors. And one of the things they looked at, they looked at behavior, they looked at academics, but they also looked at attendance. And so several of our secondary schools have developed goals and some action items on how to improve attendance. So we are, I mean, we are working on that, and that's, you know, our focus this year is to get kids in school. And like you said, you miss school, you miss out. Yeah, but is there more we could be doing? It's got, I, it's got I, bet, to speak there. I bet there is. Yeah. I think there's always more. How about now? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, there's always more. Um, that we could be doing. Uh, we've been having quite a few conversations just in the last few weeks uh, about incentives, um, but I think incentives are only effective to a certain degree. I think um, we're, we're wanting to be kind of strategic about the use of incentives. I think they might work well at the elementary level. I'm not so, so sure about the secondary level, and so um, Victoria and I are interested in um, meeting Victoria Michael uh, in the communications department, uh, meeting with some of the uh, counselors in our high schools and our middle schools to talk about um, what they find most effective at that level, incorporating that um, strategy and that message into our communications department. Uh, we're, we're wanting to make sure we're not just rewarding and recognizing uh, those students who are, who are already showing up, that we're also addressing um, all levels um, of attendance so uh, we're working on it we're talking a lot about it we hope to roll out some uh, some more uh, programs and communications efforts here probably in the next four to six weeks I would say do we have an active plan of attack for kids who are just truant are we going after them I'm not sure I could address that question. Oh, Lynn could talk about that, can't she? <laughs> Nobody's home. <laughs> Sounds like it's on. This one's on. Hey. Um, no, we are following our policy, and actually just the other day we did have a principal, and, and Lynn was summoned to court um, for some truancy, and so we are following our policy, and believe it or not, even though it's the first month of school, we have taken some kids to truancy court. Good to know. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on, on ADA? Maybe just a point of clarification for me. We're, we're measuring attendance every day and every hour, right? I mean, we report every day and every hour. It's just we only report at certain times throughout the year. Is that? They only properly 
or they only calculate it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So item B is a capital construction update. And uh, it says here it's Chris Shipley and Brian Martin. Thank you. Um, so we are pushing, we are currently looking at several properties for a potential site of a new elementary school to be funded by the bond that was approved by voters in March. Uh, one of the sites located in the city of Hayden is zoned for light industrial and would need to be rezoned for a school to be built there. For us to consider this site, the district is asking the city of Hayden to rezone the property residential suburban. The zone change request will go first to the Planning and Zoning Commission and then to City Council this fall. The district administration continues to consider a number of properties for potential school sites to meet the growth demands on the northern end of the school district. So we are pressing hard on the land purchase portion of our plan. And I've also brought in part of my all-star staff team, Mr. Brian Martin, to talk <laughs> to talk about uh, an update on the projects that are ongoing now. Thank you, Brian. There we go. Good evening. Uh, to start off, I would like to thank uh, Chris and Katie especially. Uh, they have put together a spreadsheet to track our funding on these bonds that is so simple and easy to follow and read it through that it's really making a big difference. I mean, it's easy for anybody just to pick it up and you know exactly where every project is at in detail and it's, uh, it's nice, especially for me with not being a CPA. So I wanna thank them both for that. Um, as you all know, uh, the architects have been hired and they're hard at work. We have met with all of our teachers uh, parent groups, children, uh, all of the principals, administration, uh, district office has all met several times, multiple times, and gone through all these projects in pretty much in detail to make sure we get everybody's input on what they need to make these schools run. So that's all been done. Uh, we're still doing a little bit of it today, in fact. So we had a, little, a couple things with the band down at lakes but uh it's going forward so basically right now the the base of these projects is done we know what we're going to do now we are starting the detail part and that's the basically the the cabinet's going to be you know 27 and a half inches long and all that kind of stuff is starting when it comes to budget all the projects are basically in budget let me finish the end part of that. We have some projects that we still are a little bit over budget, but it's nothing to worry about at this point. It's a process that you go through when we do these construction projects. So we are working our way through these projects to bring down those budgets to certain places. Uh, just an example, when we first started with Coeur d'Alene High School, that project's um, a seven and a half million dollar project total. At one point, we were three and a half million dollars high. We are now about $200,000 high on it. So it's just a matter of bringing the projects together. So in the next uh, 30 days, 60 days, we'll have these all in, in place and they're all being budget. So, but it's good because we're real close on everything. So nothing to worry about on that part of it. Um, right now, we're also working real hard on trying to figure out when is the best time for us to bring these projects out. And so we think that we're going to have our, the contractors will be getting their prints probably in the middle of December. We are probably going to open up our first project the middle of January. Uh, historically, that week uh, between Christmas and New Year's is not very productive for everybody. So we figured that the middle of January, we start with our first project, our first bid opening. It will most likely be one of the high schools. And then every week after that, we will open up a project for bid. 
And so um, we think the best way to do this right now is to do the two high schools first, and then we throw in Lakes and then Dalton, and then uh, when, depending on land, which we're working on right now, then this spring we'll be able to open up uh, bids for the, our uh, elementary. Things that we've gotten done so far is that we've gotten stage curtains on both the high schools that have been replaced. Uh, the track at Coeur Lane High School has been replaced. Uh, the track over at Lake City High School has been updated to uh, certain parts. They put in a pole vault, a pole vault pit, an uh, extra one. So that uh, site is all ready to go now on that part of it. Uh, Hayden Meadows got ourselves a new gym floor that's uh, beautiful. It has really turned out nice. Um, over at Dalton, we started a parking lot over there. Uh, we hit a snag uh, here the other day, and uh, actually it was Friday, and we got it cleared up uh, today. We hit uh, an old uh, dump site uh, that's been there for probably, I don't know, 80, 100 years, something like that. But um, anyway, that was going forward. Uh, if you remember, we also had a parking lot update down at Fernand. We went out to bid on that project. The bids came in uh, high, and so we shelved it, and we are going to be going back to bid on that project also in January, uh, February, right in there when we have a better climate. Uh, so uh, that would be the best time for, the, for us to be bidding. Um, you know, these projects, it's kind of like dancing, you know, when you do stuff. Uh-oh, I didn't know she was here. <laughs> but it is, it's kind of it's like dancing, you know. Sometimes when your wife has uh, six sisters, she wants to lead. And then sometimes uh, you want to lead. And sometimes you step on each other's toes, and there's highs and lows and dips. And all of a sudden, everybody's going up, and you're going down, and they go up, down, and you go up. You know, it's just, it's just the way the whole thing works. But at the end of the whole thing, you have a great time with this stuff, and it all works out. So uh, I think that we've really got ourselves uh, a great projects coming up here, and everything right now is falling in place. We have a great architectural teams. We have three different firms working on this stuff, and they're all excellent. So anyway. Um, as you can see, I'm not a public speaker, and I get a little bit nervous, so do you have any questions of me? No? All right. Yep. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Right. Hold on, Brian. Don't run away yet. There's, there's a couple. Go ahead. Brian, I just wanted to thank you for all your work. Um, I was wondering if it's possible if we could see what the architectural firms are presenting, if they would yep. come present for us, and so we have a better idea of how the projects look. I've had some community members ask me, and I have to tell them, honestly, I haven't seen you know very many of the renditions, so I think that would be really helpful for us. Um, secondly, when we get our monthly reports, can we see how these bids are coming in compared to you know the spreadsheet that you're talking about that Katie's created? It'd be nice to be able to kind of watch you know, like, how did the track come in, for instance? Was it underbid? Was it overbid? Just so we can, sure. same, same thing. If the community asks, we'll have a better idea of how mm -hmm. projects are progressing. Um, yeah. That's something I can definitely work on, um, getting those, getting some canned reports to um, present every month. Um, especially, they won't be very exciting at this point because we're not, the only thing we're really <coughs> paying for our um, architectural fees just as a progress of where their drawings are at. But once the bids come in and we get those put into the budget, that's where we'll really see, um, you know, kind of the project fall in place as far as the finances. And is it possible when we go through, you know, the monthly expenditures, could all capital projects be listed separately so then we can tell and then categorize to which project they pertain to? I think it would make it a lot different when you're going through, you know, when you're not very familiar with a lot of these items to be able to follow along. Yeah, I can definitely work with our accounts payable department yeah, to um, put that together. Thank you. Real quick, just to jump in there on addressing your first point there, which is the board diving a little deeper. Uh, Dr. Olson and I have talked about that, um, in a, and we talked maybe with Chris, I guess it was agenda planning, um, that for our October workshop that we'll discuss later, the, the design groups might not quite be ready, but um, that we tried to, to uh, schedule a November workshop 
where we do just that. We get a good idea of what the plans are, um, you know, what the main bid's going to be, what the bid alternates are going to be. So when we're looking at these in January, mm -hmm. we, we know what we're looking at and we're, we're up to speed on that. <clears throat> and Brian, just so everybody understands, the new elementary school will probably not open until September of 19, correct? September of 19th. Uh, well, let's get this land bought, and then we'll, get, and then we'll go through that. So that's our, our intent, is to get it open as quick as possible. A lot of things are going to be dictating a lot of different things, the land purchase, uh, weather, what kind of winters we're going to have this winter. If we can get this thing all rocking and rolling fast, uh, it's going to make a big difference on how fast we can get going out of the ground. The nice thing about the other four projects is that when we open up in January, most of the projects are outside of the envelope of the existing buildings. So we're, if ground permitting, we can get started in March and we can be breaking ground and getting footings in and when school gets out, we will be way ahead of the game. So uh, that's a big part of this whole uh, picture is what kind of weather we're gonna be getting, so. We'll keep our, uh, keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah, I had one other quick question, just um, some community members have been asking about ed specs, and I think at Long Range Planning that was brought up, and you mentioned that we do have them, and I heard Chris, you mentioned that we have ed specs. Where can we direct a community member to find these ed specs if they wanted to have a look at them? Just it, to ed specs, they're, they're kind of hard because they become part of the general overall spec of the project also. Right. An example is that you want a certain amount of lighting in a classroom. Well. After you put that in, that follows your spec in, this, in the core lane forever. It's part of the ed spec. So really, everything is an ed spec. An example of an ed spec right now in the core lane school district is about two and a half inches thick. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they're, they're building additional and refining the ed specs right now on the projects as we speak after we met with all the teachers and stuff like that. So probably in, um, in December, end of November, we'll pretty much have it nailed exactly. It'll be, everything will be on writing. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll be able to get you something more where you can dig into it. I think more what I was uh, questioning about is, um, for instance, like if you go to Central Valley's website on their school district and you go to their capital projects, they have their ideal ed specs for an elementary classroom, middle school, high school, that they've created through an ad hoc committee like Long Range Planning. So then the community can go here. And I, you know, Maybe we could create that in the future. We pretty much know probably what it is. Maybe we just haven't refined it and it's just not accessible. But I think it would be a good resource for our community members to be able to say, oh, yeah, this is, you know, this is what our ballpark figure is of the ideal facility. Yeah. All three firms know about it, and uh, they're going to get us something more for you yeah. on that. So... Just a, a comment. Um, we all know that this is not your first capital construction rodeo. You've had great success in this district uh, developing and delivering quality facilities for our students over the years. Um, you've also indicated that this may be your last rodeo uh, for a while, and uh, that is certainly a decision uh, you'll have to think about and render in the future. One of the things that's important as maybe you may be winding down a career with the district and Mr. Shipley winding up a career with the district is for us to memorialize this bond issue experience from beginning to end where uh, we can supply the board of trustees uh, and the leadership of the district um, a kind of a workbook uh, that would uh, give full information about the projects uh, and um, what I'd like to have, if, with the permission of the chair, is, is to draw uh, input from each of the trustees as to the types of things, the types of information they'd like to see be part of that, and certainly compare it to um, the file uh, that you've established on this capital construction project, as well as others that you've used before that have really helped you and have helped your colleagues move this forward. Um, we could supply that as a primary information source for our trustees and the community uh, to follow this bond issue 
uh, from where we left off last spring um, to where we're going to be in 2019 when uh, we're opening a new elementary school and we're admiring the new facilities in the district. Mm -hmm. It'll also give us an opportunity to talk a little bit more about alterations, um, <laughs> suggestions that may run contrary to current plans, uh, where you could counsel us on the wisdom or lack of wisdom of doing uh, uh, something different than, than what's on paper before. Um, with the permission, again, of the chair, what I'd like to do is collect uh, input from the board trustees as to what they'd like to see on that, meet with Mr. Shipley uh, and Mr. Martin, and develop that piece. Now, remember, we're talking about November, so we've got the luxury of a bit of time. Uh, but uh, the, the prospect of drawing that together, doing a workshop with this, using that as our primary vehicle to uh, kick off that discussion. Obviously, we've already had discussions about this, but to memorialize where we've begun, where we are, where we're going, and then create touch points. Uh, obviously, every board meeting for short presentations, but touch points through the year where we can um, assess uh, uh, where we are in the process, where you get a chance, uh, Brian, and, and you've said it pretty w darn well. Things happen, uh, conditions change, and to be able to bring to the attention to the, of the board, the staff, the community of necessary changes in plans and discuss options available to us along the way using this process. Um, I think it would be um, helpful for a number of reasons. One, to help us all track and follow uh, the progress of this bond issue, but also to memorialize the process for when we're not all here, uh, for the next generation of board members, staff members, uh, community members that are gonna be involved with capital construction initiatives and how uh, they can use that imprint developed cooperatively uh, to move the next issue forward uh, to completion. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. So what I, what I would ask is uh, I'll put something in the weekly memo uh, to board trustees and uh, ask that you um, run those flags up the pole and let us organize them and then meet with our colleagues to, to try to pull this together. Uh, it doesn't have to be an absolute 100% done package in November, but it's got to have the, 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 the <coughs> rudiments uh, associated with this process so that, uh, again, they'll be memorialized, we can follow them, uh, and we can continue to work with you to update and move forward. Make sense? Yeah. Sounds good. I would like to ask Brian uh, just kind of a personal question, not too personal. <laughs> Is there any school in our school building in our district that you have not had a hand in either building or remodeling? Hmm. No. No, I haven't. That's kind of what I figured. Yeah. I've been around here a long time, though, I know. too. <laughs> All right. so. And have done you. an exceptional job well, here. Well, thank you. We call that a dance card, what you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. I think a lot of times the best time to get this communication or this stuff across to each other is when you actually just sit down and start mm -hmm. talking to people about stuff. And uh, you really, uh, a lot of stuff comes out that way. I know that uh, Casey and Dave, we've been talking a lot lately and uh, about different things, you know, as they came up. And you'll really learn a lot that way. I mean, uh, everybody does. So, but yeah, we'll put it all together. Yeah, that'd be fun. Thank you. Good stuff. I, I just kind of see this kind of an institutional memory in a way. I don't know if that's the right words, but, you know, the, one of the problems is when we have people retire, we lose sometimes a lot of. A lot of things, you know, we end up reinventing the wheel later with another person. So you have a huge amount of information, history, experience, as pointed out, in all the buildings. The way to do it, way not to do it, things that have worked and haven't worked over the years. I just, I would appreciate uh, memorial, <laughs> memorializing, as you said, that, and, uh, and a path forward. I appreciate that. You know, one of the biggest things, I, and I have to say this, is that the Coeur d'Alene right now, yeah, we have the best people in our maintenance grounds and custodial staffs. They are incredible. You, you couldn't get this lucky. I mean, some of the people that we have, I mean, uh, just today uh, we're talking about uh, building a cabinet, and we have two guys that I can, well, they built that in front of you. 
I mean, we built that kind of stuff. I mean, and it's our electricians, our plumbers, everybody. And our head people, Bob Harvey, with custodial, incredible guy, Kevin Jennings, and now Jason taking over grounds. Uh, they're, they're, oh, I have to say, probably the most important who runs the whole show is uh, Becky Camerata, our office manager. We're, we do what she tells us to do every day. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you, and we will get that together. Thanks, Brian. Okay, moving on to page two. Item C is the superintendent search. And I think this is me, or this is me. And um, I'm gonna just be brief, because as you know, we haven't met um, with our search consultants uh, since our last meeting, but we are meeting with them tomorrow at 1.30 uh, here in this room. Is that correct? Yes? Yeah. And uh, I'm just going to go over kind of what our plan is for tomorrow a little bit here, but um, we're just going to discuss expectations for the search. We're going to establish selection criteria. We're going to formalize our search calendar, which I know we've seen kind of a draft version of that, but we'll formalize that tomorrow. Um, we will appoint our point of contact, most likely Miss Town. We're going to discuss advertising and brochure, discuss salary range, and then um, we will discuss the process for the stakeholder group interviews and um, who those groups are going to be and certain ones uh, that we want and um, other invitees. So be thinking about that between now and tomorrow um, as, as we meet for that. And I talked to Dr. Dean today who's leading things for uh, Mac and Jack there and uh, he's thinking about two and a half hours. I, th I think that's about what we figured. Okay. And then we'll have this update as a regular thing on our board meeting until we name our new superintendent. Okay, item D is the ISBA resolutions. Um, Tom, do you wanna? Yeah, I'll just say a few things on here. They are, there, there is a, uh, at the back of the room, there's a stack of them. If people haven't read them, don't have them. I know the trustees all have them in your board packet, and they are available to the public. I, I don't want to go through all of them. There's, uh, there were 17 originally, two have been withdrawn, but I do want to talk about it, just a few highlights briefly. Um, and these resolutions, as people know how this works, is that the executive board in, um, in September voted whether or not they are opposed, support, or neutral on these um, resolutions, and then they go to the convention in November, and they are battled out on the convention floor, and the decisions will be made. Once the decisions have made as to what the resolutions are, the ISBA is going to support then, then basically Karen Echevera and Jess Harrison two people who spend a lot of time in the legislature will have the kind of the marching orders as far as what are the things that they want to be pushing with the legislators. It's, if we can to, as I said a few minutes ago, if we can schedule a meeting with the legislators between our convention and the time they head south, that'd be nice. I'm not sure we can pull that off, but it's something we've talked about. Anyway, briefly, uh, briefly, I'm not going to go all over all these, but I'm going to point out a couple of ones. Of course, number two was the one, in, uh, the seatbelts and school buses, and that's the one that our board put together and what we're there's some, some there's got to be some opposition to that but I think the main issue there to me is what we are asking all we are asking is for the uh, legislature to set up a committee to study the issues involved in this in terms of the costs involved and in terms of liability issues those seem to be the big issues some of the other issues that were brought up were issues of local control but we're not asking, this is Idaho, we're not going to ask the state of Idaho to mandate uh, seatbelts and school buses for out the state. That's not, that's not never going to happen. And it's not something we're interested in anyway. We're just inter interested in the issue being studied. So that's one that's going to be interesting. I will be arguing that one on the floor. Um, and then as far as, um, you know, some of the controversial ones, that will be this number five, uh, the card check for negotiations. That'll be controversial because that's basically asking the 
association to more or less prove, I guess for lack of a better word, that they, they have the, they have the, um, the adequate number of employees or members of their professional association to, to represent them. And we've been told that that's going to be something they're going to not be happy with. But that is something that will be interesting to see how the, the general body deals with that. Um, as far as the other one, we already know which is controversial, which because it was controversial on our own board here, which was number nine, which deals with moving the school uh, trustee elections to November of odd years. Um, that, as we, if people recall, that failed in, in, in this board meeting in July, I believe it was. But it was uh, Caldwell School District basically picked up the, the ball on that and they supported it and the ISBA executive board gave a due pass, pass recommendation. So that's gonna be really interesting. Uh, I think there's, there's clearly opposition on this board to the, that and there was opposition in the crowd the other night and I think it's gonna be a really interesting discussion on the floor of the, of the convention. Uh, you know, and it basically it'll come one of two ways. We either will support it and go forward and kind of try to come up with a compromise or it'll be as, Casey used the words, hell no, maybe. <laughs> hell no. And, if, and then they'll, they'll uh, that'll be the marching orders to, to Jess and uh, Karen to, to fight any change in the trustee election. So that's going to be a really interesting one. I'm kind of looking forward to that one. Um, I think there's a, well, I'm not sure what else you want to talk about here. The, the uh, sale of pro public property within executive sessions. As people know now, we're allowed to um, talk about purchasing um, property in executive sessions, but uh, not allowed to, to uh, talk about the sale of it. And the reason they want to change that is if we are, that if we have to talk about it publicly, what our bottom line number is on our property, that we know what the bids are going to be from people who want to buy it. <laughs> so the idea was that that would not be. Uh, uh, that we'd be able to do that. Now, apparently, the, uh, um, the Newspaper Association opposes that because they don't like executive sessions in general. So, um, so I, I'm not sure, if, uh, really, I, you know, we could talk a long time about all this. All five of the trustees were at that meeting, and you have the information. I'm willing to answer questions if anybody has any about these resolutions, but basically, it's, we're, we're now to this, to the, to the stage of uh, talking about them on the convention floor and arguing them out. I hope all five trustees can stick around and get your, or at least get your proxy votes if you can't stick around the whole time. Um, so uh, anyway, that's, I guess, uh, two were withdrawn. One that was withdrawn was the what, keeping school board trustee elections in May. That was withdrawn um, once, I, once the executive board supported moving it to November. Um, any questions or concerns you may have? Thoughts? I'll just maybe briefly go over the process for Trustee May since uh, she hasn't seen this yet, and we'll, and we'll talk about it again. Um, but at the convention, on the last day of the convention is the business meeting. Um, they have up to 30 minutes scheduled for each of these 15 items. So I don't know, what is that, uh, seven and a half hours this could take if it went that long. Um, but that's the max amount of debate that can be taken. Um, each school district is allocated votes based on their district size and we, because um, we're one of the bigger districts, get a, a, you know, some of the highest amount of votes. Uh, what we typically have done and I think what we'll do is we split up our votes, uh, you know, we each get 20% of them. So if three of us are for something and two of us are against something, we split our votes that way. Um, so. It, and we don't have to decide now or here. Uh, it's basically on that day. If, if you're not going to be there, you can't stick around for the whole thing. Then you either give one of us the yeah. permission f to vote for you or let Lynn or, or whoever's in charge. I think it's Tambor's been kind of our tally here the last few years. You let her know what your votes are and trust that we allocate them the way you said. Yeah, yeah. it's a very interesting process. It's yeah. Yeah. It can be very political. So, <laughs> certainly number nine is going to be an interesting discussion. I think. Yeah, that's going to be, that will take probably more than a half hour. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, but it's also a democratic process. It is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And 
Yes, it's an interesting process, and we'll have interesting arguments. And it's uh, again, I, what will happen? And I think uh, you know, Stan, you were there too. That Karen basically said it, they'll get it down to two, maybe two or three or four at the most of these that they hope to put into legislation. Um, and these are actually good for two years because so they're still pushing ones from last year at, uh, at the legislature. So. Um, the biggest thing, really, I think the biggest issue, and I think this, that whatever we decide, it's important for trustees and community members to contact your legislators. Because, uh, you know, I've, I am somewhat disappointed having been on the um, executive board about uh, the lack of contact of legislators, and so they don't really know, and they really do respond to a lot of contact if they're getting 50 emails or something on a particular, or letters. I sent some letters out last year. Uh, they they pay, sit up and pay attention, you know. So I think it's going to be really important. If we if we narrow us down to maybe a few of these are really going to push, then we make a commitment amongst ourselves, and any uh, staff, administrators, parents, citizens who want to pursue these particular issues, they, they we contact our legislators because I, you know, they. We are um, elected officials, and we are we and we do represent, you know, 115 school district in the state, and we have potentially the ability. And, and all of our legislators come from you know, areas where there's school boards and school districts, and so I think we do have potentially a significant political power if we exercise it. The problem is oftentimes been we don't exercise it enough, or we put it all on Karen and Jess, and that's not fair. So because they can't do it themselves even though they're well-respected down there, well-liked, uh, they can't do it themselves. So I'm just gonna put that out, as I intend to try to be busy this winter, uh, sending, um, contacting our legislators, and I hope the rest of us will too. Okay, thank you, Trustee Hearn. Dr. Nelson, we are now on page 74 of our packet. This is item E, and it's the Ad Hoc Math Committee application. Good Absolutely. evening, sir. Good evening. Chair Morris Rose, Superintendent Olson, and members of the board, I, with, along with Dr. Cottle, have been talking to you over the last several months about plans for secondary mathematics. And we've uh, put together a lot of ideas, and we have it backfilled also with professional development that f uh, fully starts in earnest this week as well. The, but the most important piece to that, as uh, you've referenced, is making sure that we have our community involved in this process. Uh, with your permission, we would like to send this application out to form a new ad hoc advisory committee that would be uh, um, basically accountable to you in making a recommendation to you and working with us to be able to find the best solution to improve uh, secondary mathematics, not just for getting our results up, but making really some substantive change in how we want instruction to look. So this application is in front of you tonight. Uh, we're hoping that uh, you might be able to consider it. If that is the case, we'll put it up for about 30 days up onto our district website and uh, during your November meeting, uh, present to you names for your consideration. I had a question. This looks fantastic. Is there any way that we can reach out to some of our partners in the community, NIC, University of Idaho, Lewis and Clark State College, and get some representation on the community from them as Absolutely. well? Absolutely. Uh, Trustee May, as well as Superintendent uh, Olson, and Chair Morris Rowe, we actually have an existing math ad hoc that advised us three years ago with our current adoptions for ready math. And those contain, or that particular uh, committee uh, contains leaders from our higher ed community as well as our uh, local community as well. We will be reaching out to them to ask for their continued participation as well. And I think part of that is important for us to be able to take some of that past context as well as to what they saw and what they remember as well as the current work through uh, Minds on Math to be able to move forward with that. But absolutely, that will be a point of focus. And do you have a certain number, maybe I missed it, that you're looking for for the committee? I, I would say a, a good ad hoc for me typically is around the mid-20s. Okay, perfect. Uh, it provides us a good opportunity to get a, a good breadth of, uh, yeah. of participants in the community. And I know we have several nonprofits that I'm sure are very eager to be involved in this process and making sure that we're just fairly represented and we're not Absolutely. Yeah, from all aspects of our community would be really nice. Do you have something to add? Okay. Mr. Chairman, um, 
Dr. Nelson, I know it's very, very important to you because you and I have talked about this, that we also make sure that um, those individuals who had concerns about uh, the previous recommendation to the board uh, that the board uh, put on hold last spring have representation on this group. Uh, they are folks, I think, that uh, um, once given the opportunity to take a look at what's been done, where we are, and what our options are for the future can be extremely helpful in the process and move from, um, I think, citizenry that's concerned uh, to citizenry that will advocate uh, for a final proposal that will come to the Board of Trustees. So we really need to reach out uh, to those folks and, and uh, make them part of the process. I agree, Superintendent Olson. Thank you. That is essential. I'm just going to piggyback on that a little bit with a couple things. One, uh, when we had our uh, data summit in here about a week or so ago, uh, the new president of North Idaho College was here, and I had the opportunity to speak with him for a few minutes, and his his name slips my memory right now. But he uh, was very eager and um, you know would like to see more collaboration between our district and North Idaho College. Um, and, and wanted to meet, and I know uh, Dr. Olson's met with him some, but you know, would like to see us uh, engage in more of that. So that, that might be an idea. And then uh, th that got me thinking about something that Senator Nonini said last week, where he talked about, um, and I'm not sure how much of it's anecdotal or backed up with data, but uh, it talked about how there's certainly a lot of discussion that a large percentage of students that are graduating high school are getting remedial math and remedial uh, ELA and those sorts of things when they're going to college. Again, I, I'm not sure how much of that is actually data-driven and how much of that's just talking points, but it made me think, you know, if there is a disconnect and if there's something that's missing, it would be great to have that representation. Um, so maybe we're, we're addressing where there's holes, so. Absolutely, just, thank you. I guess echoing what what Trustee May said that uh, certainly that secondary education is an important piece of what we're trying to do there. And I know you know that. Is Scott going to do one of his really cool like, advertisements on Facebook? I, it was neat how he did ad hoc literature. And mm -hmm. is he going to promote this committee the same, I'm guessing? And as just as hubby. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other questions for Dr. Nelson on that? Okay. We're into action items already. Um, and we just have two items that are back. They were information items last month. Dr. Cottle is here with item F, which is our continuous improvement plan. Yes, thank you, Chair Morris Rowe, um, Superintendent Olson and trustees. You will see on page 7 to 8 of your packet our continuous improvement plan. What this is, is this is a plan that's required by the State Board of Education, and we're um, required to have it approved by the board and posted on our web page. Um, for patrons to view. Um, just want to remind you and capitalize on Dr. Olson's comments earlier. Because of the data summit and our work, um, just keep in mind this is a living document. So as we work through things this school year, we may be able, you know, we can add, we can, add we can make changes, um, we can do some updates. Um, and so it is a living document. Um, you will see on there there's goals on the side and some performance measures. And we've also updated on there um, how we are doing. Some of those performance measures are required by the state board. Some of them are ones that we developed as a district. Um, and you'll see some of them also replicated in our college and career advising plan and our K-3 literacy plan. Um, so at this time, um, Anna, Anna Wilson and I are here just to answer any questions that you may have. So board members, is there any questions on uh, this item. It is a requirement that it be posted on our website. I think it's posted on there now as a draft. Um, it'll not say draft, I guess, after uh, if it's approved. Correct. And then as the school year goes, if we make any changes, then I think we will note the changes and um, the date of the new draft so people can see that. I'm looking at the benchmarks here. These are uh, goals for academic improvement, correct? Correct. And those, a lot of those benchmarks we, um, we actually developed ourselves. Um, when we were given the template by the state board, they had some suggestions, but some of those benchmarks we put in there, and um, I would say that they're quite lofty. 
This is great seeing this. What happens when we don't make the benchmark? Then we knuckle down and, and try to figure out why um, and try to, you know, obviously make any corrections and things that we need to do. Um, we do, you'll notice that there is some growth in here, but we didn't make our benchmarks. So that's something that we'll work diligently to do. And then you're no, you'll notice that there's some metrics where we've gone down. And so that's part of our data analysis piece and part of our summit is to go in and drill down and try to figure out why and then try to make corrections and This amends. is probably about holes and we need to figure out how to fill them, yeah. Well, my first one was just an observation um, looking at ISAT compared to um, the IRI. It's the data doesn't really correlate, and so I'll be excited when we no longer have to use that old ISAT and put it on a benchmark because clearly it's not giving us very good information. Um, but beyond that, I was wondering under the performance measure for the high school students, can we add, I see you have the percent of juniors and seniors participating in AP dual credit or CT capstone. Can we add the number that are taking the exams and passing to get the credit? What is it, three, four, and five? Might just be another good metric that we can have. I know that was brought up at the data summit and it's kind of a hot topic right now, so it'd be easy to add. And then, and then um, the other one was the FAFSA, which I'm not super familiar with, and I'm interested to learn more about it during our orientation, but we have a lot of nonprofits that are wanting to help and get involved. And it seems like that might be a low-lying fruit where we could say, great, that is an area of need. Is it something that we could train you know, volunteers to help students fill out the FAFSA, FAFSA form, or is it more complicated than that? Um, no, it's not that com it's not that complicated. Our college and career advisors, that's one of the um, their goals. Yeah. And I think part of the problem that we have with the FAFSA, it's not just it's not just filling it out, but there's certain things they have to go back and complete that we're, that requires tax return information from parents, mm -hmm. and so I think a lot of our struggles there. Um, and last year was the first year we had our college and career advisors. Is really that parent awareness piece that mm -hmm. after you go through and do the initial application to make sure that you follow up and get your tax information in there. Yeah. But but definitely you know the use of volunteers and I think. You know, and, and the use of our director of communications to help get that information out there for parents so that they know to help their student with that piece. And the career and uh, college counselors this year, will they be meeting with every senior or is it, what are the expectations for their, I know they're going to be busy because there's... Um, they can meet with every senior individually, but they will also be hosting a series of activities um, throughout the course of the year. Um, I'm saying a lot of ums. Um, Scott and Maven, right now we are we have scheduled some meetings to sit down and actually get a communication plan together so that way we, we can reach out more to parents. We find sometimes um, parents often won't come into our schools or they're busy and so if we can have an opportunity where we go out to them. Um, an example is Brittany Preston at Lake City would hold coffee nights where parents could come and she could help and provide some individual planning or small group planning. And I, I just wanted to add, um, tomorrow is the All Things Seniors Night, and it's at Lake City hosts it. I went last year as a parent. It was amazing. Lots of great information, and, and they will be filling out the form, the FAFSA form, in the library. Um, I got an email, and it listed all the stuff that you said that parents miss, you know, what you need to bring social security number, tax information. Um, so that's tomorrow night, and I'm hoping they have a, a huge turnout. That's just one thing. They have um, a number of different things. I, I went to a couple. Um, they kind of have like a class. And um, so yeah, that we just really need to advertise that. I don't know if they're going to do it another time. I know it's real huge right here at the beginning because seniors are getting ready to apply for colleges. So, and they'll probably push it again on college application week and, and do some yeah. activities around that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk? No, so, I think just to get us back on track a little bit, the I, I think that's some great ideas and information we have there. Uh, add in the the AP testing, um, and I think as we you know, next at our next data summit, we dive a little deeper in sec into the secondary stuff. Um, you know, those things we can address. And some of that too. I, I like something Dr. Olson talked about that Boise did 
which was they kind of focused on um, well, the U.S. world. Uh, world yes, yeah. you know that that was part of their focus, and which is a number of different items. Um, but I think that's great that we we incorporate that stuff as we move through kind of this new process. I wanted to just point out, and I borrowed this from Lisa real quick, uh, at the ISBA, the workshop schedule came out this week, or we received it in the mail this week, and there's two on there around continuous improvement plans. So it doesn't say who's going to be presenting them yet, but good stuff. One's actually a continuous improvement plan overview. The other one is annual continuous improvement plans, literacy plans, and college and career advising plans. So good info. I'm sure it'll be good information. Um, I this is probably the third or fourth year I've seen these continuous improvement plans and I've always just kind of wondered uh, I kind of I think it was kind of what Dave said like you know what if you don't meet your benchmark if you don't meet your goals how often does wonder we have these plans you have these lofty goals we don't always meet them we meet many of them but we don't meet some um, that always concerns me is like what I assume you'll give us feedback as to at some point, okay, we've set this 5% increase in this area or whatever, and 10% increase, and we didn't meet it, so this is our plan to address that, right? That's that's always been my concern. Sometimes we get these reports, and then we never, maybe you report them, and I just don't click in my head. That wouldn't be surprising. But oftentimes it, it doesn't, you know, I don't always get a feedback that, well, you know, we met this goal, and this is why, and that we didn't meet this goal, and this is why. And I think a lot of that's because we've just reported at a board meeting and we haven't sat down and really dived into the data. And that's the nice thing about the data summit is it really takes a lot of time to sit and dive in, look at how different schools are doing, look at trends. Um, so on November 15th, if we have the data summit then, we will definitely go through and look at some of this. And you'll look at it by school. Um, you'll be able to see where there's some schools where we're having big jumps in math where, and others maybe in um, English and language arts. And so I think part of the problem in the past was that we really haven't dived into it and had that in-depth discussion, discussion and then talked about, okay, where are our strengths and where do we have weaknesses and what are some things that we can do to address those weaknesses? Uh, I appreciate that because often I, I, I think maybe Dave, I'm speaking for him, but I've felt before we get information, we approve it, then it disappears. We never found out, we find out really what happened. So um, I appreciate the and data. And there's a story behind all this, and so we need to get to that story. <laughs> no. and, and it's a continuing story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think the, the most effective way, and we've talked about this, at least for us as a board to, to kind of manage this, is to align our continuous improvement plan, our district goals, our superintendent evaluation. And, and, and we, I know we've talked about that a little bit. We've talked about doing a workshop with ISBA. I, I talked to David Brinkman about that again. But with all the superintendent search and things we've got going on, we've kind of pushed it back. But I, I certainly think as next we move into next year and we have a new superintendent and we have a great resource right now, we need to refine how we do our superintendent evaluation, how we set um, our goals for our superintendent and, and align all that stuff, and, and it'll help. Right now they were all different. Oh, I agree. Our, so I, I, just kinda, I just kind of gloss over and say, well, I guess they know what they're doing. <laughs> and I always assume that you know what you're doing, and you do. But I just like to, have to be involved in the feedback sometimes. Do you agree, I, Dave? I get that look I'm getting from Dave. Well, <laughs> I, I'm getting the idea I think we need a break. But yes. let's take action on this first, board, if we could, and then we'll take a quick break and then come back and just wrap up. Is there a motion to approve the 2017-18 Continuous Improvement Plan as presented? So moved. Second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Ms. Town, let's take a five minute break.
Uh, okay, okay. We're, so we're, we're, I'm going to go ahead and reconvene. And um, leadership awards. We are at item G under action items, which is our leadership awards. LE. So we saw this last month. And I think it's right at the end of our packet today, page 83 and 84 of the smallest packet we've ever had. <laughs> Okay. Um, Chair Morris, Rowell, Superintendent, also members of the board. I don't really have anything to add unless you have questions from last week. So we just need action so um, we can move forward with these leadership awards. I wasn't here last. Can I say something? Yep. Oh, I wasn't here last month. But it I, what I like is uh, it seems like a, a good chunk of this money is going to the hard to fill positions, right? Yes. And that's yep. what I think is really important. I just think that's a good idea. That I mean, not that. There aren't great people throughout the district, but you know we got some really tough. You know, there's there's a what is it 100,000 to special ed. Yeah, 100, yes. Yeah, yep. that's that to me is is good. So good. I just want yep. editorial comment. <laughs> I agree with Tom. If there's no further questions, then is there a motion to approve the? Leadership Awards for 2017-18 as presented. So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries, Ms. Town. Uh, a couple things here before we get going is uh, call for committee reports. Uh, whoop, whoop, whoop. Got one more at the liter literature committee. H. I don't have that on mine. Oh, wait. No, that's called for committee reports. Yeah, we got it. Yeah. Are you going from an old agenda? Am I? Well, I think we My apologies. Yep. My apologies. Um, committee reports. Have we had anyone that's met? Long range planning has met, and Lisa, I don't think I uh, gave you a forewarning, but in the call for committee reports, you would just uh, kind of recap for the board just briefly what. What happened? I know you guys had an exciting meeting. Now, Steve, so you're listening now. He's going to hold my feet to the fire if I get it wrong. <laughs> uh, we had a great first meeting. We had uh, pretty much almost 100% attendance. We have two positions that are left, uh, are still open, and we're looking for members from Brian, Venture, or Nexa. And I think we're in, probably going to fill those this week or next week. Um, and we gave overall kind of the first meeting is to go over what happening in the district we got a construction update uh, Steve laid out uh, what our year would look like and I think we overall had a good meeting we had lots of great discussion lots of questions asked um, and we kind of reiterated to them that they have a really important part as far as getting the word out in the community about capital projects and what we're doing in our long-range plan and being a positive spokesperson for the community and it was neat to hear uh, one comment that I think was difficult uh, was from a parent from Fernand and she raised the question of why the parking lot wasn't done so it was a good opportunity to be able to answer the question, give her the information, and really to get back to her about exactly when we're going to get that bid process going. And thank you for Tom Hearn for coming and sitting in and listening. I have a quick question. Does Long Range Planning uh, know about our efforts to realign the boundaries? They, we briefly discussed it, but not much. Um, but I had input on that but I was going to save it for later but you know doing reading about other districts and how they do long-range planning and attendance that might be an area where we could combine two committees so we're not having so many separate ad hoc committees and taking up so much time you know, from district administration uh, I think long-range planning has a really good idea of the work that's been done and sometimes with attendance zone it seems like they go back and have to cover what long-range planning has been doing so maybe in the future next year when we look at realigning our zones it might make sense to merge these committees or combine them somehow certainly as we bring a you know larger capacity of 11th elementary school on on or a new elementary school uh, on we're, we're gonna probably have to look at all 11 zones uh, of elementary and, you know we've seen a lot of busing and shifting and all those sorts of things between the schools and I know that's not fun for anyone so it would hopefully be a time to clear the deck and try to get it all right for a little while anyway. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, you 
Casey, I did forget one thing. I think one of the questions that we also were fielded was about this EdSpecs, and that's why I asked it tonight. And I really wasn't familiar with the term until you know recently, and people asking. And you know, Brian and Chris mentioned that we have EdSpecs, but I don't know that they're EdSpecs specific for our district. And Central Valley is kind of analogous to our district in that they're about the same size as we are, and they've struggled to pass bonds. Um, in the past, but they had their ad hoc committee, and it was a long range planning committee, create their own ed specs, and they used information from architects and um, community members and construction people. So they have a set of specifications now that suit their district. And so I think in the future, it may be something that long range planning or a ad hoc committee can work on. So when we have our next capital project, it makes it a lot easier and clearer, and, and it gives a lot of community buy in. Uh, the calendar dates, a couple things to remember. Tomorrow we'll be back here at 1.30 with our superintendent search consultants. Um, and then I advised you guys, normally we'd have our mid-month meeting October 16th, which would be the third Monday. Um, I'm out of town that week. Uh, and, and I believe Dr. Olson is also. Is yes. that correct? Yes. We just talked about so uh, we talked about there's five Mondays in October, so we would just move it back one week to October 23rd, um, and that would most likely probably not be too long of a session to be policy uh, workshop because we're working through. I know a number of you are working through policy 8,000. Is that what section we're in? Um, so we're almost at the end of the book. Um, so it'd be a nice way for us to get a, a good chunk of that uh, reviewed instead of sitting in here at a meeting and talking about it for an hour. When we finish the book, do we then start all over again or can we be done? <laughs> well, I, I, I think it was a long time that anyone went cover to cover, you know, and that's why it was started. So Lynn yeah. probably knows better than I do, but I, we're always going to be looking at policy. <laughs> we will always and forever be reviewing, but this mass review from start to finish has been years. Uh, we've needed to do it for years. It's one of those projects you put on the back burner yet. We, knew, we know we need to do it, but something else always gets in the way. So to get the ISBA model policy uh, through uh, Glenda Pope, my counterpart and I did a big happy dance on that one because this was so needed to review all of our policies and it's been a long road coming but once we're done that should that should take care of it with the exception of the updates that ISBA pr provides on a I think quarterly basis so they now are keeping up with the changes in statutes of course we can always change what we need um, but it won't take near the amount of time that it has taken to do this review and that's the answer I was looking for. Thank there you. There you go. Glad to help. And then I'll just throw one more on here, which would be November 15th for Data Summit 2.0. And if there's nothing else, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn. Okay. Good night. <laughs>